So this is the Fujinon Duvo 25 to 1000 millimeter. Let's hear what's happening when you take this lens to the safari in Kenya to shoot elephants. You're watching Cinedy, supported by b and and CVP. Hi guys, I'm Johnny from Cinedy and I'm here together with Bob Poole. Uh, you are a cinematographer, actually wildlife cinem cinematographer. How are you? I'm fine, thanks for having me. Thank you. We have a lot of nice stories to hear. Just a second, guys. And we are here also with Victor from Fujifilm. Victor, how are you? I'm doing great. Day three. I'm alive. Yeah, we are all alive. One more day to go. But we are here to talk about your experience in Kenya. You went to Kenya and actually had a very special setup of the Ari Alexa 35 with the Duvo lens. But before we even dive into this, how did you both meet? I mean, Bob? Victor? Well, I actually met Bob last year at this show. Uh, Tom Fletcher, who works with me, introduced us and said, hey, you got to meet Bob. He, he, he's going to go to Kenya. There's going to be a great idea. And uh, I met Bob and within 10 minutes, I was like, okay, yeah, this guy's cool. He's cool. Great storyteller. Uh, just so passionate. I was, I was watching him scroll through footage on his iPhone and he's like, that got cut, and that got cut, and that got cut. And I looked at it, and I was like, there's no way that that got cut. It looks so good. Yeah, so it, it, we, were, we, were, we were friends at the minute I met him. That's very nice to hear. There's nothing like friendship, huh? Bob, but you, you actually um, have been in this business for quite a bit. For the people who don't know you, in short, in a nutshell, tell me about your passion and profession. It's okay. I'll hold it. So you're free. so I was I was raised in Kenya. My my parents were uh, involved in wildlife conservation. Uh, we my older sister became like the world's leading expert on elephants, and um, I made my first film for National Geographic uh, uh, about her about 35 years ago, and so um, that led me down this path. And I've been making elephant films as well as everything. I worked in as a DP doing. Uh, uh, nature and science adventure films, um, but basically the last ten years, I've I've um, I've been doing mostly just natural history because I like it. <laughs> and you're working with different cameras and different lenses, I guess. Mm -hmm. Originally, what did you used to what what type of setup you used to have? Well, I started um, on film, Super 16. We used to shoot. Um, I had an Arri SR2 uh, Super 16 camera, uh, Zeiss lenses, Canon, you know, prime lenses. We didn't have much to choose from in those days. As time went on, I shot, you know, I got my first HD cam was a F900, and then I got the the uh, Fujinon uh, 25 by which was 13.5 to 416. And uh, just that lens really changed my career because finally I had a lens, one lens that did everything I wanted to do, wide and long. But this is kind of an ENG lens. It's yeah. made for two third inch uh, broadcast cameras. Right. So you kind of use the aesthetic, the picture aesthetic when using it. Well, as, as you know, back in then, that's all we had, right? We only had two thirds inch. Um, uh, um, and so then when we got into full, you know, f uh, larger sensors, Super 35 and such like that, there still wasn't a lens for me that I liked. So I kept using my Fujinon and um, I used it through various adapters. Um, you know, I got down to where I was filming on a red and I could crop my sensor down to 5.5K and still cover the, the full sensor with a 1.4 adapter. So if you follow what I'm saying, it's like suddenly I still had this lens that did wide and long at the same time, and that's what I needed. So Victor, when you hear this story and you go, hmm, actually, we have a new lens, yeah. something very special in the market. Yeah. When, was this, when, when was the time that you had this idea to match between your new lens and, the, and, and Bob, who is extremely professional in what he does? Honestly, I didn't have the idea. I was just listening to Tom and Bob talk. And they were like, ah, you know, they're him and hawing about, uh, well, it's a little big and how we, we're not sure we can take it out there. And I, and I kind of kept listening. And, and then at the end of it, I said, you don't know if you don't try it, <laughs> you should just try it. And, and they, they both looked at me and said, did you just tell us to send the thing to Kenya? And I said, I, yeah, if you don't do it, if you don't do it, you won't know. 
So what is the thing to send to Kenya? It's this uh, Fujinon HCK 25 to 1000. It's our a cinema box lens. So the idea that you would send a, what, 75 pound lens halfway around the world to put on a cinema camera is, is, is wild. It's, it's actually kind of, kind of crazy, kind of stupid, and I'm lucky. But you know, big risks, big reward. Yeah. So Victor says, let's do it. And you go like, yeah, let's do it. Or like in your mind, you're already thinking about, technically speaking, what, 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 how are you going to set it up? Yeah, well, I, was, um, I lost a lot of sleep over it, to be honest, because I, um, I was like, okay, uh, it, 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 if I can get it in position, I know it's going to be great. But the problem is it's really heavy, and, um, and, and it, therefore it needs to be supported properly. And we're, we're off-road, and we're driving through bad conditions under terrible... We have a lot of dust and wind and rain, and you know it's it can be pretty uh, intense out there. And then you're taking a, a very expensive lens, and you're putting it into that situation. So I th I thought a lot about it, and um, I actually went to Africa. I I chopped up my vehicle and redesigned things. I I and I made it work. Um, but I still didn't know until we got out there. And and then in the moment that I started using it, the very first day I was like, wow. This is it. There's, n this is the b absolute best lens for this job. You know, if you get it in the situation I had it in. Okay. So, first thing first. First of all, did you have an insurance for the lens? Um, yes. <laughs> because you so. said <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like who cares? Like we have to shoot first. Second, uh, you are you are filming mostly elephants. Yes. What what is there any specific? challenge when you shoot elephants yeah i mean look um you can't predict where the behavior is going to happen that you're trying to film and so sometimes it can be very far away and other times it can be right next to you and um i've got, i've been in the situation in the past where i was you know prepared to shoot something very far away but not super close and when the action came too close i didn't have the shot i couldn't get wide enough to get it elephants are big when they come close you need to be wide so this is the beauty of this lens, actually, that the focal length is satisfying yeah. on a large sensor camera. But it's more than that, because it also looks beautiful. Because, you know, the thing is, um, with a long lens, you also very, have a very shallow depth of field, no matter what. Um, with this camera, it's, 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 it's a shallow depth of field, but it has a beautiful uh, roll-off to the out-of-focus sections of the image and so it really focuses your eye to exactly what it is that you're trying to show and um you know i do my own focus and um you know it, it can it can certainly be challenging but i think after three months working with that lens i i can focus it on what i want to as it moves and so yeah i mean i it's it's um it's it look it's on all levels uh, um, once the camera is sitting on the head and the head is level and balanced and um, and and at that point, it's like any other lens, right? So I can, I had it on a slider, so I can swing it, you know. So I'm constantly comfortable, which is important, so I'm not shaking. Um, so I can point the camera in any direction I want by just sliding it like this. Um, all the controls are here. I've got like my zoom, focus, iris, all on this hand. Uh, oh, sorry, focus on this hand, and everything else is here. And you know, even if it comes to the um, expander, 1.5, so it actually takes the lens out to like 1,500 millimeters. I can flick it with a, a, a switch on my hand, on my thumb. And um, at that point, I can't even see a difference in the lens. That's how good it is. When, when the ex expander goes on, you don't see a change in light or quality of the image. It's extraordinary. I, I would I end up with the expander on and I'd forget it was on. Which camera did you use for this specific mission as an A camera? It was an Alexa 35. Which, so, you know, so the combination of those two things makes a, a stunningly beautiful image. So, Victor, you are, I don't know if there was a kind of uh, camera to cloud operation so you can actually see footage while Bob is filming. Did you use camera to cloud or that was just um, not really the place to do it? I think that we looked at the entire production as Bob's project, right? And we didn't want to add any additional complexities or, or, or uh, technology to the conversation because we were already asking him to put a lens on the side of a car, right? It looked like, it, like he was just going into battle.
right, on a tank. Because you had this, he had this jib at the top of it, and it looked like something out of Mad Max, right? And I think that um, we, in addition to that, we sent uh, dock crews out there as well. So we had a lens go out, we had extra people go out, we had all this gear go out. And, you know, I mean, as much as I want to say that connectivity and Wi-Fi exists out in the bush, I'm not sure that that, that that's a, that could be a priority, you know? I think the priority was making sure that Bob had support, that he could get the images that he wanted to get and leave some room for creativity, right? Leave some room so that he could see an image that he could never see before and then have a, a tool and support to make sure that he could, he could get it. Well, obviously you're shooting and you're driving and the whole setup is quite heavy. How did you um, manage stabilization, for example? <laughs> so that is a great question. Um, it, very heavy, uh, very heavy with the weights for the jib, the, the Duvo lens sitting out, you know, quite far outside the car. Um, and then also a gimbal on the front of the car. The, the, the Land Rover was really uh, quite heavy and um, at a certain point I actually had to change um, my springs because in the, in the back I have an airbag um, inside of a coil spring so I can adjust the, but the front end was just getting softer and softer and lower and lower and it, it actually was becoming uncomfortable. So I had a friend of mine send some new springs down for me and I changed them one, uh, one day and it, it, it improved it, but, but it was still heavy. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the internal stabilizer on the lens is the fantastic I you know we're three of us in the car at all times because um, and you know uh, there's different cameras being used and you can't help but move when you're operating a jib for example so there was shake inside the car not to mention wind and you know so the internal stabilization on the lens was phenomenal um, but then on at the same time you know the other two cameras uh, were on um, were on gimbals that were you know on a spring arm so they uh, they were they were also um, isolated from the, any kind of dampening. I would say that the one thing that you know really uh, had worried me was driving around, because you know we're driving over uh, off road. Elephants when they walk, they they often if it's wet they'll 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 their feet will go into the ground. You know big holes like this, and then as it dries up, those harden like concrete, and you can't see them. And when you hit one of those things, it's a real jar. So I was worried that you know that the that the uh, twenty five to one thousand would would get a hit like that, but it, the way it worked out, I had built this um, a cage for it that I then suspended the cage that w attached to the lens from above. So the camera was at the lens and the camera was actually free to um, to swing like a pe pendulum on the slider, and inside the bowl, I never had to tighten the head very tight at all, and the whole thing could go like this, and it rode like. Uh, a baby in a cradle. It was, um, and and actually, the, the we, we used to take the lens off at night, every night, and put it on a bed. It had its own bed to sleep in, but it took two of us to pick it up. Funny, crazy. Sorry, that's a better. <laughs> Victor, but um, so there was an Alexa 35, and the Duvo lens, but you also made sure that Bob has a backup cameras. Yes. What did you supply him with? Uh, we supplied Bob with GFX 102. Um, we also provided uh, our, our dock crews with those cameras as well because we wanted to have redundancy and backups. Um, we brought XH2Ss out as well, and I think maybe even an XH2. And I think the, the, the reasoning behind that was, as I was hearing Bob talk about his previous projects, it was always, you know, my primary camera, my primary lens. You know, it's one camera, one lens for him. And all of a sudden, I had this idea. I was like, well, why don't we just supplement it? Why don't we just give the, the whole production access to more tools? And that's when it started to make a lot of sense if his A-cam was just going to be an Alexa 35 and it was going to be locked off and on a car and they couldn't move it. Well, what happens if he needs to drop something on the ground or go up to a tree or shoot a time lapse, right? It, it, it makes it so much harder for him to get be flexible. And I said earlier, it's like, oh, we want him to go out there, make something beautiful, and show that versatility comes from having different tools. And I, I, I loved what I saw. So how much actually did you use the GFX 102? A ton. So we use them, we use them all the time. So I almost always had a time lapse running during the day somewhere. We built this um, crazy contraption um, in a workshop right there uh, where we were staying um, with some rebar and some uh, steel plate. And we built a cage for the uh, camera 
uh, the GFX 100 too. So we could just um, literally drop it on the ground and let elephants step on it if they wanted. And they did. And uh, it was amazing the footage we got out of it. It was pretty stunning. Um, elephants uh, are, are obviously really big. A bull elephant can weigh six tons. That's a lot, right? So, but the thing is when you're when you're next to one, it's very impressive. When you're underneath one, it's like, it's unreal. Like, so to get underneath an elephant like that, a wild elephant, that's pretty hard to do, but like we figured out a way to put a camera down and, it, uh, and to have that on a large medium format sensor that you can get all that glory. I mean, it was incredible. But we also use the cameras um, as like, so uh, the Area Alexa 35s, and all of our cameras, we never had a single issue with cameras, but the gimbals gave me problem. Like my, I was using my own personal gimbal, which uh, R2, it, it broke because of the, you know, the, the constant beating it was taking. And um, so for a while I was down a gimbal. I got another one, but, um, but in the meantime, we were stuck with an RS2, that's all we had. Well, we put the RS2 on another a spring arm that I have and we, we, the jib, we never missed a day. Like we needed that high wide shot always. That was part of my plan was to always have an establishing high wide shot because we're in a very flat plane, you know? And um, to me, it's like when I see something just always shot from one angle, it's, you know, that's, and we can't use drones, right? So with around the elephants and it's very, the permits and all that. But I have a jib there that's tall and can, so the, uh, the GFX uh, just saved us. How did you actually match the look of the cameras? Was it challenges or challenging or not so bad? So to be honest, we're just mid, we're midway through the, 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 the shooting phase of this film. We haven't gone into post yet, but um, because I got to spend a lot of time, uh, um, thanks to Victor with the, uh, the, with the Fuji Films um, BTS crews that came out, to, I learned so much. And to see what those guys have done, I mean, you can watch it on the monitors here. I didn't see a, 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 a drastic uh, difference in the, because you know it's incredibly great optics in the in the um, in the glass, and then of course you're dealing with this amazing sensor. So, you know, nice. yeah, and I'm very much looking. Be great. And Victor, will you support such a crazy initiative one more time, once again? I mean, I, I think that I have to be. Uh, that's a hard question because every time I, I say yes or no, something crazy happens, and I'm like, "Oh, that that was that was really cool. Let's go do it." You know, I think um, if Bob came back and said, "Hey, I've got this other idea. You know, I need to go back and do a couple other things," it would be very easy to say yes. I think um, everyone who worked with Bob from from our team had such a wonderful time. Um, the, the 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 crew that we sent out, they're some of my closest friends now, right? Um, they they've become like family to me. And what Bob said the other day was that, you know, they have also become part of his family. And so that's kind of, for me, where I really enjoy saying yes to these kinds of projects. Because when you, when you say yes to the right person, it just becomes an extension of, of, of what you care about, you know? So, yeah, I mean, we could probably say yes again. I'd have to, <laughs> I'd have to get a couple of approvals, but yeah, I think we could do it. Bob, before I wrap up this conversation, I really want to hear about the pros and cons of working with such a lens. 25 to 1,000 millimeter. It's a lens that's meant for large sensors cameras. Would you do it again? And what are the pros and cons? Absolutely, I would do it again. Um, you know, my um, for this project and for so many projects that I have done or would like to do, uh, I, you know, as long when I'm working out of my vehicle, the way that I've now set it up, it's absolutely no problem for the lens, you know, so that's not an issue, right? Um, I could also see in wildlife, you know, you do often spend time sitting in a hide waiting for things to happen where you're here, you know, you're just stationary for that kind of application. If you can get it to where you're going to be, that would be the only challenge um, right now. To me, the only challenge at all is moving that lens from where it started in, Bur in, uh, in California 
to Nairobi. That was a, a challenge because um, the, the shipping conta uh, container is uh, 106 pounds and the cutoff limit for me was 70 pounds for check-in. So what we want to do, because the lens weighs uh, 61.7 pounds, and um, I spoke with the folks at Thermodyne. They think they can build us a case for for uh, it, it, under uh, 10 pounds. So if we can get that thing down to 70 pounds, it means we can check it on the airlines and it, then it can go anywhere. And you think about it, a 60 pounds len pound lens can go in a backpack and one person can carry it with no problem. So it really is not out of the question to take this lens anywhere. Great. Bob, thank you very much. Thank really you. nice talking to you. Victor, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, Thank you very much for watching and please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.